Okay, today I've decided that um, while I have just a little bit of time here, I'm going to go over some examples from my own family tree to try to explain um, basically how I've applied some of the um, different techniques that are used in accounting and auditing and applied it to um, genealogy and how that could be used by other people to help them pretty much sort some things out in certain circumstances. Um, I guess that the <coughs> the real the real question of course is you know how do you know, you know what is it that's going to allow you to actually know that the person in your family tree is the ancestor that um, you know you have listed there you know, <laughs> you know somewhere up the tree grandpa great grandpa etc cetera, etc cetera, etc cetera. and what I'm going to do is I'm going to discuss about evidence discuss evidence quality and I'm not trying to say that one birth certificate is better than the other um, what I'm actually going to talk about is situations in which um, well uh, the fact that someone was or was not uh, an individual's parent uh, can only be derived by the limited information that you have. You know, in some circumstances, there were no birth certificates in the in the area, and uh, so I'm going to go over first of all some of um, the ancestors that are actually in my tree that I'm going to say that reasonable assurance has not been obtained. I'm also going to define what reasonable assurance is. And reasonable assurance really means that you have what I call sufficient competent evidence, or not what I call, but what the accounting uh, industry calls in when they're looking at financial records. But I'm going to apply this to genealogy. Um, and I'm going to go through these examples, and I'm going to go through um, a very unique find that I had recently where I feel I have sufficient competent evidence, but. Um, arriving at that conclusion is very complicated. Then I'll come up with some other situations. I'll also describe what is limited assurance, and that is um, not not a um, not proof that, that constitutes sufficient competent evidence, but rather um, a set of circumstances that um, cannot be disproven and leads one to believe that the individual in question is the son or daughter of their parent. I'm also going to try to discuss in all these different subjects that the primary and, and show that the you know the primary assertion that people are trying to prove and the most important material assertion that's made in any family tree is who someone's parent is. And so until such time as you have reasonable uh, sufficient competent evidence, you can't say that you have reasonable assurance that a child of you have listed in the family tree of a of a, of, of a parent that that itself is, is an assertion uh, you can't say you have sufficient competent evidence to support that you can say you have um, in some circumstances you can't say that in some circumstances you can only say that you have limited assurance that is the geography makes sense the circumstances make sense but you just don't have that birth record you don't have that will Okay, so uh, things of that nature, it's been said elsewhere, but you can't get to the documents to prove it. Assigning a quality level to your record is what's going to help people differentiate where um, more research is actually needed or not. Um, also, um, now there's, uh, when I talk about rec really talking about assertion quality actually uh, between you know, the assertion between the child and the parent uh, but there's also so, there's also an animal called record quality so you know you to get um, anywhere of course straightforward circumstance is that you have your own birth certificate right or you know your grandpa's death certificate, and it says you know who their what the name of their father and their mother was, and you know things of that nature, and that would that would provide 
by all appearances sufficient confident evidence you know that that's who that individual's parents were parent the parentage of that individual has been proven you have reasonable assurance you know instead of the circumstance well my um uncle you know i i don't know who my parents are but i was born in this very small town with a population of five and my last name is jones and the only jones couple living in that population of five was martha and william jones that's limited circumstance li limited assurance it only has uh, it only places the the subject individual that you're trying to prove the parentage of that assertion the primary assertion you're, that you're trying to prove you only have circumstances to show that their parents were indeed you know the Joneses <laughs> that I just mentioned you know fictitious example but it, it gets more complicated than that little it gets looser than that and then the final third type of um, uh, quality of assertion is just compiled and that's just basically someone put, put it together but proof hasn't been provided that hasn't been, hasn't been examined it's in the form of a family tree but no assurance is placed on its accuracy whatsoever most of the family trees out there are like that unless you're, you know of course in such a case where the notes provide some kind of evidence with it so you can examine those notes and make a choice for yourself or and i've never heard of any type of uh organization out there writing a report to say that uh i you know, i've examined the family tree and i based on my professional judgment there is sufficient i have reasonable assurance that the, the, the family tree is free of material misstatement. You know, what is a material misstatement? Material means anything important that will make a difference to the outcome of whatever the subject is you're talking about. When it comes to family tree, uh, parentage, of course, is material. If I get my parents wrong, then all the way up the tree, all as far as I go, those aren't going to be my ancestors necessarily. They may be, you know, indirectly. Eventually, they're going to get caught up, but... <laughs> it's just a matter of math, but uh, on the other hand, uh, in the intermediate generations, you know, you, it's actually they're all wrong. Okay, so what I'm going to try to do is use these examples to show, and I'm going to tell you what the answer is uh, for each one of these, whether I think I have limited assurance, no assurance, or reasonable assurance. So. Um, First one I'm going to go into is, um, and this is this is one where I'll just say up front that I don't have reasonable assurance, but I have very good limited assurance. I would almost say, almost say, I have sufficient competent evidence. I would almost bet, almost bet my life that this uh, one ancestor was the son of another. Um, I had an ancestor named John B. Chichester that, you know, I have documentation. You know, I know who my grandfather was. I got my grandfather in the census, living with his grandfather, Alfred Augustus Chichester. And I can even see in earlier census records, Alfred Augustus Chichester living in John B. Chichester's household. And I also have or my own family records that uh, were given to me and they basically said that, you know, my grandfather was the grandson of this guy named Alfred Augustus Chichester. Okay, so, and let me pause for a second. Uh, to know you have reasonable, uh, sufficient competent evidence and or reasonable assurance, uh, in general, but not exactly, you have to have both vital records and the story around the vital records to make it. If you just have a set of vital records, but you don't have a story about the individual's life or some kind of outside, you know, it makes sense that they were there, you know, the birth dates of the children or just after the marriage, you know, analytics, other things that, that make, make what you, the assertion make sense besides just the vital records, you don't necessarily have uh, sufficient competent evidence. Now, of course, a death certificate is going to give you both. It's going to give you the vital record, the date of death, probably the date of birth, but we're just talking about modern death certificates. 
and it's going to say who the mother and father father were, and that tells you the uh, the, the whole story. It, you know, it, it it gives you the context of the relationship between parents and children, and it gives you the vital record. If you just had the, the a death date for uh, for you know the individual, if you didn't have the death certificate and all you had was the father's name, his birth date and death date, mother's name, birth date and death date and you just had the name of the supposed son and was written down, you know, you really wouldn't know just by that information alone that this person was the child of the two people listed, even if it was asserted as such. You don't know for sure based on what you see in front of you. That that doesn't give you enough information. The death certificate does, you, you know, it, it comes from, you know, uh, a civil authority, someone that doesn't care about the outcome of how the record reads, which is very important, and then um, also the procedures that are followed to gather that information or, or to inquire of one of the children what was the name of this person's father. <clears throat> okay, so an understanding of basically how the records were gathered that you're going to rely on is, is part of it, then you have the, the whole context of the situation, and you have exact dates. Now, in modern days, of course, um, probably up the 50s and later, or the 40s and later, people started having, you know, not only birth certificates, but death certificates, and, and marriage records recorded at the governmental level. But before that, even my own grandfather that was born which I actually don't know. I have contradictory records. Um, he certainly was born on this, uh, on the day Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, but whether it was 1903, 04, or 05, I don't know, because his baptism from the church says 03. Uh, the, the, the delayed birth certificate that uh, his sister said, um, uh, signed, and he notarized for himself, um, had him in 1905. He can be born in any, you know, any of those three years, you know, and it's hard to, the census, you really can't narrow it down, I can't find his 1930 census, his 1910 may be the closest to accurate, uh, you can look at it analytically, but I, but I digress, but basically, um, yeah, my, my, the reason why I bring that up is because in the 1800s, the state may or may not have recorded the vital records, a church may or may not have recorded the vital records. And before 1850, you got to hope that your answer is in a place where the vital records were recorded and they're easily available to you now or not. So anyway, I'm, I'm going to let too much detail with that, but I'll start with my first example. So I have, a, I have without a doubt, sufficient competent evidence to get up to John B. Chichester. John B. Chichester, and if I can look here in my own database... Look a bit odd if I put my own screen on here. Hispanic Tree Maker 16 in Ubuntu. I hope to find. Okay, here I am looking for Enoch Chichester. There's only one of them <laughs> out of thousands. <laughs> this is my database of Chichesters, and I have thousands, a lot. <laughs> And there's only one Enoch, Enoch ever, as far as I know. Check that again. Yeah, there's only one. Okay, so I have here a birth record of 1793, death of 1865. And I have a son, John Brookenmine, and he's one of the few that I have an exact birth date for, together with um, his you know, supposed brother, Charles Edward Trichester, who's actually uh, an officer in the uh, Confederate military. But I digress. Okay, and this is a little bit, this is a little bit outdated. I have a little more information about Sophia Birkenbein's parents. Okay, so yeah, I have a birth date. It looks like John Birkenbein Chichester's birth date makes sense relative to the marriage date, and you know, the brothers and sisters kind of are every couple of years. That kind of makes sense. Maybe there was one between eighteen twenty-seven and thirty-one. But you know, the question is where did I get the, where did I get this information? Right now, these are just assertions. Okay. Now, where I got John Birkenby Chichester's birth record, at least, 
was from um, his passport application. And I had to mathematically calculate that based on how old, you know, years, days, and months he said he was when he applied for the, for the passport. And he said that he was born at Reading, Burke County, Pennsylvania. He never says what his name of his father is. <coughs> you go to, to, to Enoch, the, uh, the birth date there comes from the Stanford collection, uh, not Stan uh, the Barber collection for Connecticut, for, for Stanford, and the death record comes from a newspaper notice in 1865 that said that he was a the exact months, days, and years old. And when you subtract those dates out, it comes exactly to 1793. And the birth record, uh, July 11, 1793, and the birth record at Stanford says he's the son of David and Mary Chichester. And I have a marriage record for Mary Nichols. So his parent, the parentage for uh, between David Chichester and Mary Nichols, and so the parentage for Enoch is fully established. There's no death record for a Mary Chichester in New Canaan uh, before his birth. There's no remarriage record, so it should be Mary Nichols, U.S. parent, and David Chichester. Then we get to Enoch, and now I don't, since he was born in Pennsylvania, there isn't a barber collection for Pennsylvania. The Pennsylvania archives, as far as I've ever seen, only has... Um, just some war records on, you know, that you can look through. They're typewritten summaries of actual archives, but they don't have anything scanned and online that I've seen. The only thing that is scanned and online relative to Pennsylvania during this time period are census records. But the problem is John Burke and Brian Chester had moved out of the house by 1850. He was born in 1823. And so in the 1840 census, he'd just be a little check mark on a column <laughs> on a census record. That's not going to, you know, solve anything. So, how is it, or, or how can I place John Birkenbein Chichester, who was born in Reading, and this record I've actually, this John Birkenbein Chichester death record I've actually since updated. Um, he, he died in Brooklyn, Kings County, New York, and it's, I think, 1892. Or three, he's buried in Greenwood Cemetery. How could I say that a man that claims to be born in Reading, Berks County, Pennsylvania, that lived in New York, who was married in New York, had all of his children in either New York or New Jersey, but one had a wife whose family had been in New York for for years, be the son of a of a man who was born and died in Fairfield County, Connecticut. Where on earth do I get that? Okay. Well, I have a little more information than what I'm, you know, uh, I, I've led you, you know, I've been a little misleading in the way I presented that. I do have John Birkenbein Chichester's son, Alfred Augustus Chichester's death certificate that says that his father, you know, says his father's name is John Chichester. I might even say John B. I haven't looked at it recently, but I, I'm pretty sure it says that. It says that it says that John Birkenbein Chichester was born in Pottsville, Pennsylvania. I look at Enoch. And here, it just looks like he's living in Connecticut. But the truth of the matter is, is when you look in census record, Enoch Chichester would be the only Chichester anywhere close in area or vicinity to either Reading, Pennsylvania or Pottsville, Pennsylvania at all during the relevant time periods. Except the other people that are indicated as his, his children of, of various ages living in the same household. That, that is an example of limited assurance. I don't have exactly sufficient competent evidence. What if there was another Chichester that lived in the, that part of Pennsylvania? In fact, he may have been the only Chichester in Pennsylvania at the time. Um, 
that um, they just didn't answer to the census taker one year, and he had a child, his name was John B., and he moved on. Well, I'd be wrong. So that'd be a material misstatement. So I don't really necessarily have reasonable assurance. I don't necessarily have sufficient competent evidence. Not until, not unless I was able to get John Broken by a tractor's death certificate from Brooklyn, which I plan on doing next, because now I know his death year. You have to do it in like two, three increments at twenty dollars a time, a couple months at a time. It'd be a very long process since the 1890 census was destroyed, and I had no idea. Uh, when before 1900 John Birkenbein Chichester had died, and when after, say, 1885, he had, you know, I had a whole 15 year range. I mean, now that I know his exact death date, I'm going to get that. And if, it, and, and if that death certificate happens to say his, his father's name was Enos Chichester, then I have sufficient confidence. In this. Or if I'm able to get my hands on Enoch Chichester's will, which is going to be a hard. Thing to determine, Enoch pretty much after he graduated from medical school went to live in um, either Schuylkill or Burke County, Pennsylvania for a number of years and um, then didn't really go back to Fairfield County, Connecticut just, until just before he died. He was buried at Pound Ridge Cemetery, um, which is close to Fairfield County, and one of his children. I think I've recently found out our grandchildren were living in Pound Ridge, but besides that, you know, so I, I don't know where I'm going to find it, Fairfield County, Westchester County, or, <laughs> or Schuylkill County, where would I find his, his, his will, and he would go by the name of Enos also, don't know. Um, Alright, so that, there you go, there, there's an example. Okay, the next one is... James Chichester, who was in at Taunton when the uh, New, England New England Confederation came into place, and um, he was listed as one of the men that were over age 16 and able to bear arms. Okay, so here is the deal. Okay, so another researcher had, and by the way, when I put together this uh, Chichester genealogy database, I put together not only all the information from the history of the family of Chichester, but also of William Richard Drake's um, work on the Chichester family, which I consider to be of high, higher quality. The result isn't much different. In fact, he left out the entire branch of the family that became the you know Chichester uh, Marquis of Donegal, but nonetheless, um, he had, in his book, he had wills and birth records, and he would say how it is he arrived at his conclusion based on the records that he had. He didn't have all the, the, the parish registers, and even, he didn't, I don't think he had, he had most of the church, early Chichester wills, but not all of them, and some of the later Chichester wills he did not have. But he had most, but he didn't have the Woodworthy birth, marriage, and death parish registers from the Woodworthy parish of Devon in his book. I had to get that from the, um, from the local family history center. Okay, so what's the deal? Okay, so we, the whole, the descent from John Trichester to Thomas C. to Raleigh has been exceedingly well documented by. William Richard Drake, all the way down to uh, John Chichester and Dorothy Dobby. There's a he had a son named William Chichester, and you can see that from the parish re record in entries at Woodworthy. It has William Chichester, you know, son of John and Dorothy. And since I had put together all this information, plus I added U.S. Census records, U.K. Census records. Books. I mean, anything I could find on the internet, any any information about tractor trips on the internet, just about as of maybe two years ago, is in this database. And I'm still adding little pieces here and there. But uh, nonetheless, out of all that stuff, of all the known information, uh, this William Chichester here, son of John Chichester and Dorothy Daubeny, 
was in fact like I'm about ready to say this uh, he wouldn't have been the first William born for him <laughs> first William was in 1481 but let's see in that century there were only two of them uh, William born in 1578 and another William born in 1582 another one born in 1583 so we, uh, three of them in one string in the 1580s this one was baptized at Tawistock but there's absolutely no information to place him in any kind of contact with anybody else except for the fact he was dead six years later um, this one is of course the husband of Susan and the only other one was baptized at, at Swinbridge the son of John but again was dead five years later and this John was the son of an Amias Chichester and Joan Gifford okay so the only Williams that lived long enough to survive is, is this William right here. Two have appeared in, in, in Salem and, and show up at the church and have you know have a wife, sister, Trigester, and have a, a set of children baptized. Then we look at this James, who also showed up at Taunton, supposedly my ancestor best I can tell it's really messy to get there um, the only okay so in 1545 there was a James and he he did live at Bishop's Taunton he had some sons John Philip Tristan Lennon Leonard and Arthur Arthur as far as I could tell but um, you know he was born too young to be having children in the, you know in Salem in the 16 20s, 30s, and 40s, and he was born about 1545, you know, maybe later than that, but not not too much, okay? Then the next James was born in 1609, and he was dead two days later. He was the son of a Leonard, Chichester, and Alice Slowly. After that, we have our James. The only, the only one that was alive, as far as I, I can tell. I mean, I can't say that I've gone into every single Devon Parish, but I'd say about at least a third of them were covered by Drake. I know Drake missed at least one, but I do have a baptism record here at Woodworthy, and I have no death record for him, and I have no death record for his brother. But I have death records for all his other siblings, even as late as 1687 but none for them. They're the only ones that just kind of disappear from Woodworthy. And we're, you know, okay. Then, so, the question is, is the James Chichester that showed up at Salem, eventually went to Huntington, died 8 September 1696, and had a, a wife that was one of the Porter sisters, and I'll explain that, maybe in a different presentation. We're all to say, in, in short, that the record that's always cited for uh, saying that, okay, this, this, this is when Jonathan Porter gave some land to James Chichester, that is a record of marriage between James Chichester and Eunice Porter. The, the conclusion's absolutely wrong. What the record says is, is that Jonathan Chichester is going to give to James Chichester some land so long as he allows his wife Eunice Porter so we're his means Jonathan Porter Jonathan's Porter Jonathan Porter's wife is Eunice there's other documents to support that it's not James Trichester's wife she wouldn't be called Eunice Porter she'd be called Eunice Trichester <laughs> so so she, you know that that that's not a marriage record we know by Giles Smith's um, state proceedings at Huntington that James Trichester showed up and he was in fact a husband of one of the three uh, Porter daughters. We just don't know which ones. Now if there's other proof from the other two sisters as to which one married which of the three sisters, there were other three sisters. One was uh, Mary, Elizabeth, and Eunice 
Um, we can't say that James Trichester's white was Eunice. We know it was one of them. We just don't know which one. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay, so the question is, well, how do we know that this guy came out of Woodworthy? There's a lot of Chichesters in, in England, you know, in Devon County. Well, I've, I've gathered them all, and I know this is the only one. They could have been on all the records that are out there. Now, the problem is, is that a lot of the Devon Parish uh, rec uh, parishes have locked up their records, and you have to you have to have you know magic cognition, and, and, and you have to be psychic and know uh, when these people were born, and you, and you have to guess at which parish and have them go spin the reels for you and look for the record that you guess at, and if it's not exact for them to find, well, they're going to come back and say they didn't find it. Or you have to go down the, there yourself, and of course I'm not from England, I'm from California, and I'm not going to get to Devon County anytime soon. So I'm not going to be able to, to go look for all these different things. Now, over time I might be able to go to the Family History Center and order a microfilm for each and every parish in Devon County, and over maybe a course of a number of years I can come back and say I've fished out every single Chichester birth record in Devon County and probably expand it to, to some Somerset and I could say that they're you know <laughs> this is the only guy but for now I've got a very good collection of birth marriage and death records especially from Drake and this is probably a pretty good indication that um, you know I don't have proof basically I have limited assurance right now, let me say what makes sense analytically. Um, James Trichester would have been, I, in my opinion, a bit old to have been married. Now, when you look at the Salem church records, and this is extremely important, and I'd say 99% of the family trees out there get this wrong. And I don't know, I may have done, the point I'm going to make right now may be buried in some presentation. In fact, I'll pause now because I don't want to run, run out of time, and I'll recontinue.